Yeah, thank you for this very kind uh, introduction. You might be confused about the um, variety of um, different topics of my work, but it's not that confusing once you would have um, the chance to see it, because I, I have also been uh, claimed as the one who does uh, the uh, curatorship by authorship. So I, I in fact, um, introduce into all of my even big topics, um, they may be political or cultural topics, my own um, position and uh, view, and I, I keep it uh, until the very end. And I, I still um, collaborate with uh, other scientific groups and um, authors, but I, I, um, I remain the captain, so to say. And um, if you want to hear more about my current uh, work, it is interesting that um, the Rhine topic, the uh, biography on the river Rhine as a European biography, as an access to the uh, making and the civilization of um, Europe from the Celtic and then Roman times to the integration of Europe nowadays uh, has been asked uh, to, to be done by me as a curator uh, from the French side. And this is quite amazing because I'm uh, German. And if you know about the conflicts and the wars uh, that were held and, and fought out on the Rhine throughout centuries, it still is even more amazing that they uh, choose a German to do so. And it was even meant to be the inauguration um, exhibition for the Maison de l'Histoire de France that was to be built and set up as the equivalent on uh, French soil for the German Historical Museum under the presidence of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. And when Hollande was elected, everything uh, fell apart and was erased. And um, so uh, my project landed on the boards of the Rhine still at the Art and Ex Exhibition Center in Bonn. And I had to retranslate my French um, introduction and, and treatment to German. And uh, within a week I got the okay. And that's what I'm working on now. And um, I am um, still uh, quite amazed about the fact that I get the utmost highest level of items that I ask for because all these uh, institutions uh, concerned, including the Louvre or the Bibliothèque Nationale or the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna or many libraries, know my work and, and I get really the highest possible level of um, um, manuscripts, illuminated manuscripts or artifacts and, and works of art, also from uh, all European countries concerned, like um, the Netherlands, uh, the Rijksmuseum, and from the permanent exhibitions. And this is in the line of uh, very big shows that I have made. For me, a clear um, sign of, in fact, um, existing European integration because uh, they, they know those people that have to decide on, on these um, um, things, uh, that it is a big, big topic that has to be uh, delivered by the utmost best means. So um, just to encourage you to um, take your um, courage to, to uh, do the, the most um, demanding steps for the best quality of work. It, it is sometimes really welcomed by the right time, if, if you do it um, in a, on a straight line. And um, I'm very glad for that because I have much less work uh, due to this um, very good welcome from the institutional side. And this is also due to, to the career that I was able to do, but still, uh, there in, especially outside of Germany, there's a lack of understanding 
in many cultural institutions about the fact that you can do um, historical themes uh, and approach them in a very interesting way for a large public. Because nowadays uh, those institutions have to count very heavily with the affluence of visitors. And uh, they, they start to count from 100,000 onwards. And if it is the Louvre or the Grand, the Grand Palais in Paris, they start to count from 300,000 onwards. Otherwise, they don't even give a look at it. So you, you are bound, I am bound to, to meet that uh, line of success by any means. And that uh, also gives some pressure to what uh, you have to achieve. But um, if you have a clear sight and, and a clear statement and, and quite a um, good um, position uh, how to deliver the message um, and make the visitor live uh, that experience by the way he, he sees uh, the items and um, get some more in-depth uh, understanding of uh, European integration by the mean of historical uh, rooting of his um, understanding and I'm afraid to have to say that uh, the lack of um, knowledge is increasing, then this kind of uh, exhibition is even more necessary. And people start to understand that also outside of Germany. I get many demands that I can't even fulfill because I don't have the time. And I don't know if you have ever worked with um, items, uh, objects, artifacts. They have a very uh, special language of their own and you, you can't betray it. You, you have to, to really deal with them. And um, finally, if you achieve such an uh, exhibition, you have to collaborate in the finishing phase with about 30 to 50 to even more people, the restorers, uh, all the, the technical part, the architects. So there are many, many different steps to be taken until it is really uh, ready to be opened. And um, there you, you have to have um, uh, to, to prove your ability to, to be um, a leader, but in, in the way that you can still um, pursue your line and, and not betray anything that, that you have thought out before just for little reasons or um, censorship. It, it has never occurred to me, but it, it might occur. And it, it does occur if you take the example of the Manifesta exhibition that is now uh, opened in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And, uh, with the uh, commissioner, um, uh, the curator Kaspar König. He, he was almost knocked down by Putin and, and his uh, apparatus uh, censorship on diff different levels. So you, you can always get involved in actual political conflict and then you must really um, be able to, to show that you are um, uh, armed to, to face them and, and uh, find solutions without betraying uh, your context. And that is um, a growing challenge, especially uh, when it comes to um, confrontations like with um, that uh, Russian actual situation. And I'm also, as Mr. Donfried pointed out, um, contributing um, lecture to the Copenhagen uh, meeting in early September on my exhibition that was held in the National Museum in Copenhagen, opened by uh, Queen Margaret II, uh, who kept all the, the waiting visitors um, waiting for her um, for more than an hour because she was so interested in what I had to show her that she just forgot about the 20 minutes granted for her visit. And that was a highly, highly political issue because I treated uh, the topic of Mare Balticum that is almost impossible to be treated uh, by the um, um, 
curatorial step or the conceptual step to, to do a, a cut through all the naval fortresses uh, boarding the Baltic Sea. That um, means uh, I had to deal with um, nine different national histories, including the Baltic uh, states and also Russia, or rather the Soviet Union in the last period. But by the concept that made the visitor f uh, follow that itinerary, itinerary um, throughout the um, uh, history and the story of the national fortresses, it never came to any uh, political confrontation in, in the sense uh, that um, uh, people would not give what I have asked them for. Um, and um, it became a big, big success in the National Museum. It was uh, asked for several other um, uh, venues in the Baltic uh, states and also in Sweden and in Poland, but they finally could not um, finance uh, the uh, transport and uh, insurance um, necessary. And um, it is a bit difficult to, to um, tell you what it was about because it was quite complex without any images, but you may have the um, uh, opportunity to follow up the um, presentation that I will do in Copenhagen, because it, it has been claimed as one of the examples how to deal on, on a very large scale uh, with a um, cut through 2,000 uh, years of uh, myth and history and art uh, with the most conflictuous area that you can possibly think about. And, um, uh, that would be my last, maybe before we get into um, uh, debates of questions and answers that you may have. Uh, my last um, point, uh, if you treat such an issue, then you get a very, very clear meaning of uh, the um, uh, importance of uh, borders throughout centuries. I, I traveled to all these borders. I, I saw the fortresses built up on the Russian side and the other one on, on the Latvian or Estonian side. And um, I, your generation tends to think that uh, there are no more borders because of internet and Google and, and social media, etc. But they are there. And the, the mentality of these borders uh, is still um, maintaining. And that is a very big uh, political issue that you should uh, be aware of it because if um, we don't find the means and that is maybe the, the task and the task force of um, this Institute of Cultural Diplomacy to deal with um, this mentality of um, block ups and um, uh, real, um, yeah, I, I would uh, say even fossilization of attitudes uh, in uh, national and nationalistic um, minds, then um, you uh, should at least get um, ready to think about it. This is one of my um, moving um, reasons for my work, and um, it, it still keeps me going on, and, and it will keep me going on for certainly another 20 years, I would say because I, I get enough um, offers. And um, it is something that um, really tells uh, the story of uh, things that have been f forgotten or tend to be f uh, forgotten about, that peace is um, the most precious uh, value that you can possibly um, achieve. And especially when I did my uh, Idea of Europe show in, in the pay building here in Berlin in 2003, I had the uh, pleasure to see many, many heads of state and advisors and ministers really um, stand in line almost to, to see that exhibition because it was built on the manuscripts and texts uh, also throughout uh, 2,000 years 
building the, the line, the, the uh, file of um, uh, Ariadne, to finally uh, build up uh, the European Union after the catastrophe of the um, two world wars. And um, Angela Merkel, already then the Chancellor of Germany, she uh, sent out the catalogs, I think, 500 times to the heads of states. And uh, from sometimes when I happen to meet uh, with their staff or, or even with themselves, they tell me that they, they use uh, this catalog of mine like a handbook. Because um, even highly based politicians have to learn a, a lot about what they uh, do and, and execute in their role. And this catalog gives all the historical background of uh, the uh, decline and, and um, failure of uh, concepts for peace and integration throughout 2000 years until uh, the building of the European movement uh, from 1948 onwards. So it, it has a strong also moral side, what I do. And um, it's not just history or art history, it's between the lines. And people understand it. And I don't want to praise my, my work, but I, I have a press archive. And sometimes uh, there are already some uh, uh, doctorships uh, based on my work also. And uh, I hope uh, someone will get the idea to work exactly on the press, uh, international press, press um, issues that have covered um, my work because they all get this message. And that is something that is really fulfilling because um, I never sit on the same chair uh, after the inauguration of these exhibitions. I, I do the next thing. And then the, the child, to, so to say, has to find its own way and, and do its own, fulfill its own message. And that really happens. And um, I hope that you get some kind of inspiration by it. Because um, it is rare to do that and to be able to do it. But it's um, utterly inspiring and enriching. And um, it's beyond any innocence. It's highly political. And just to finish, I tell you a little anecdote that is quite um, yeah, um, a good example. When I did the Bismarck show, that was in 1990, and no one ever had the idea that the two Germanys might be united. And if you do these big exhibitions, you have to start at least uh, three or two years ahead. So um, I was not uh, a prophet to see that either. But I based uh, the personality and the life of Bismarck as a biography on the European stage with all the movements of um, uh, unification uh, of people and um, uh, also the, the um, uh, chase and uh, um, um, they wanted to do the um, uh, they wanted to abolish all the, the um, monarchic re regime. I included the industrialization, uh, the workers movement, and uh, I made a big opera on uh, the stage of Bismarck's um, biography, with all that um, line of his. Uh, his um, political actions. And uh, I had to, to um, get some loans from the Musée de l'Armée in Paris. And uh, they keep the um, habit that they have um, highly posed military um, personalities uh, as directors for the Musée de l'Armée in, in the um, um, Chateau des Invalides, behind the Dome des Invalides. And um, uh, the director I had to deal with was in, in civil uh, clothes. He had no uniform and he was very charming. And he said, um, if you betray the French national identity with your Bismarck show, 
because you know that there were a lot of conflicts between the French and the Germans uh, throughout centuries until after the Second World War. Then I, I take this little cannon and shoot it at you. And he was uh, charming and laughing, but he meant it. He really meant it. And uh, I, I got everything I wanted because I'm completely fluent in French. Uh, then I had to do the basic work with all the uh, registrars, etc. And uh, in 19, when was it, 88 maybe, yeah. Um, they still told me uh, that they had difficulties to deal with uh, Germans because they had so many uh, losses in their families from this or that or the other war. And there was not that easy going um, exchange between two nationalities like uh, in, in the Auberge, Barcelona or whatever you are living now. It, it still was something different and strange and even hostile. And if I was not able to speak French fluently, I would not have um, got all these uh, highly precious loans uh, because the, the language overcame that national gap. And this is just an example. It would not be the same now, but um, the uh, ability to speak languages uh, except from English is one of the, the main means to, to build that um, necess necessity of uh, peaceful relations. And now I'm stopping. So Dr. Van Plessen, maybe just to get the ball going, let me ask you the first two questions, uh, and then I'll give the moderation maybe over to Alessandro since you're sitting in the front, uh, and you can help with the, the other questions and comments from everyone else. First question, Dr. Van Plessen, what is cultural diplomacy? For me, I... I oh. For you, of course. I think um, cultural diplomacy is uh, uh, the, um, the wisdom to uh, accept the other as being the other and remaining the other and not trying to fill the gap between the you and the me, but um, trying to bridge uh, a dialogue uh, that will interconnect the two sides to one fulfillment of um, uh, equal interests. And I, I really um, can say so because that is the line I'm acting on. And many people, even in, especially in, uh, in the um, outside of Germany, have always told me that uh, this is uh, for them um, a very important mean to deal with, um, uh, especially uh, German issues because um, I have a career of almost uh, t more than 30 years and um, there were some, as I told you, uh, periods where it was quite difficult. And uh, I, I got these big um, uh, topics because uh, those that gave me the, the task knew that I, I would be the diplomat to do it. But based on knowledge and um, also on behavior, on language, and um, on uh, the ability to deal with very difficult partners. Very difficult. I, I tell you another ex uh, example, you will laugh. Uh, when I did Marianne in Germania, I wanted to have the, the uh, authentic um, document, the original of the uh, how do you call that, the um, diploma of um, Friedrich von Schiller, who was um, uh, um, elected um, a hero of the French people for his contribution to uh, the humanities by his writings. So I went to the Archive Nationale in Paris and asked for the original diploma. I had the copy. Uh, they, they looked it up on the um, computers. I did so myself. No one could ever find anything. And they, they got very ashamed about it. 
then I looked up again on, on the copy and I, I saw that uh, the name of Schiller was written um, non, not correctly by Gilles, G-I-L-L-E-S. And then we, we found it under Gilles. And that is how uh, two national, nationalities deal with each other. You always have to, to take some yeah, um, different ways and itineraries to, to get to what you want. And this is also one of the means. You, you, you mustn't always do it directly. You can do it very well in um, meandering ways. But you must come to the, to the uh, final goal. Excellent. And my second question, and then I'll, I promise I'll give the microphone away, is uh, regarding cultural diplomacy in Europe. Uh, tonight is a big soccer game uh, between France and Germany. Uh, on the one hand, no big deal. Uh, on the other hand, if you look back not so far, actually, in the European history, before the European Union, that's a really big deal. <laughs> the oh. fact that they can, in peace, come together and play a game. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you think of how much slaughtering and violence and, and killing uh, took place between France and Germany not so long ago. So this is actually following up a little bit on our conversation this morning. You know, what relevance does cultural diplomacy have today in Europe? Uh, in the sense, uh, what I've noticed talking to youth uh, around Europe, we've been doing conferences in many countries, there seems to be almost a complacency in the sense, eh, Europe, Brussels, not so important. And it's eh, peace, okay, take it for granted. Uh, and the fact that really we're living in peace in Europe, in the European Union, where we mm -hmm. can travel without a passport, uh, I would think is a really big deal. Uh, and I would see European Union as a huge success. Uh, whereas if you look at even in the media, the way this is perceived, very often, let's point the finger at Brussels. Uh, they're making life difficult, they're causing problems. Problems. Uh, and it's a great, very popular thing for national politicians to do, but to blame on Brussels. And that kind of intensifies it. Uh, so I think for me as an outsider, a non-European, uh, it is fascinating to observe this, where again, you go to Greece and they have certain feelings about Germany and Europe. Uh, you go to Cyprus and they have uh, re clear feelings also about Germany and Europe. Uh, you go to London or you go to the United Kingdom, they also have certain perspectives uh, on this. Uh, I don't think we can take it for granted. So just as kind of a, a big question, but maybe you could give just a, a brief answer. Uh, is there a relevance for cultural diplomacy in Europe? And if so, how? Uh, you know, in terms of really crossing, transcending those borders, bringing people together. Um, where do you see the, the biggest opportunity for either art or culture uh, to maybe strengthen bridges uh, in the European framework? Well, there, there is uh, this given structure that is uh, quite well settled now um, with the European Parliament and the European Commission, but uh, I can give you the very recent example how it can be violated uh, by very um, odd means. Uh, I, I was quite uh, shocked when I read this uh, just yesterday that um, Marine Le Pen, uh, the leader of the Front National with her 20 representatives that were elected with her party, um, were also participating in, in the first session in the Strasbourg uh, Parliament. And when the hymn was uh, played, they remained seated and they, they started to, to chat and, and to make jokes and to scream because they don't like Europe. So this is just the, the gap and the cliff that we all have to deal with because uh, you can very well um, uh, give your vote to all these parties, but uh, as you may um, know, the. Uh, the, the right-wing activists are on the move and they are growing and growing and they get more and more influence. And uh, I think the best mean um, to fight them is uh, to integrate them by communication and especially uh, those that might vote for them. Uh, so the mean of communication creating as um, it uh, is done now by um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, our foreign minister uh, to solve the Ukraine conflict and, and uh, take the arms away, uh, put people uh, around the table and make them talk and have them say what they have to say and find a solution, not a compromise, but a solution. And don't um, um, get away from the enemy, but take him in. Take him in, don't, don't make him active, make him active for what you want him to um, do for your um, views and uh, visions. 
and uh, this is um, the only mean to deal with the right wing parties and um, uh, also if you want to, to deal with them you must know that they are really dangerous they are and they, they are the worst target for a representative uh, democracy because every conflict like in France now the the failure and the decline of the UMP, the Sarkozy party, uh, will be counted uh, on, uh, on the favorite and, and uh, gaining part uh, numbers in um, elective uh, increase uh, of Marine Le Pen or the Front National. That's the way it, it will be dealt with. And you have the same example with um, the, the Dutch um, the right-wing party, and in Poland they are quite active as well. So that's why it is so important to do this kind of work that I do, where you see the, the wounds, the, the failures, uh, the, the, the real um, decline of um, historical positions that led right into disasters, and uh, tell the mission and the and, um, base the knowledge of uh, things that have not be, been uh, improved yet. There's no real improvement. We have to work for it. Um, hi, I'm Lisa. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you first said, um, that uh, you're feeling that the integration and the idea of integration of the EU, it's reducing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, uh, for your personal opinion, which are the main reasons and through which ways we can uh, change this tendency? Thank you. Um, the, um, when I did the Idea of Europe exhibition, I really got aware of the fact that um, uh, the final decision mainly um, stirred by Churchill uh, already in, uh, in the years of the war in 1942 and onwards with his famous speeches uh, was based on the insight that um, uh, the European countries could not uh, get anywhere um, without um, establishing peace. And um, that was an insight based on the catastrophe of destruction uh, by two world wars and by fascism, uh, not only from the German side. And um, this is something very brutal, if you would uh, think about it, that you can um, build up a system of peace and integration of different uh, countries uh, based on, on this insight. So the, the main thing we have to avoid is uh, war and conflict, or deal with them in a proper way. And um, now the Ukraine conflict uh, is one of those um, means uh, that give a, a real um, yeah, challenge to the European integration itself. And um, many, many of those experts that um, comment on it are no real experts because they don't know enough about Ukrainian and, and Russian history. They, they are not able to comment because it's a very complex target and task. And um, I ho really hope that uh, the uh, newly uh, elected president uh, Poroshenko will be um, able to solve that from his side because I have the very personal uh, impression that these um, separatists are not uh, really uh, supervised by um, Russia. They may be armed by Russia, but they are not supervised by them. They do whatever they like. They, they are real terrorists. And that is a completely new challenge. It's beyond um, uh, the concept of uh, territorial integrity because uh, they just want what they, they fight for. They don't uh, uh, think of uh, Ukrainian or Russian issues. They want their area to be 
freed for them. And, and that's a new challenge for Europe as well. And it, it might even nourish in a way the other separatist movements in Europe. Think of the uh, vote of the Scottish people that is uh, up on in September. And then the Catalans and all those others. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, it's been really, really uh, enjoyable to listen to it uh, in, in the way you introduced art as a tool of cultural diplomacy which unites us. But I want to uh, discuss an example of an artist, a Czech artist called David Czerny, you probably know about him, whose work is probably an illustration how art could also divide uh, us as Europeans. Um, one of his exhibitions uh, basically portrayed the 20, 27 at this point uh, European uh, Union member states through a different photo or uh, like for a different image and uh, he chose to portray one, one of the one, one of the newer member states as a Turkish toilet which was uh, a little bit offen offensive for the actual population and uh, it kind of uh, you know it bred some more anger and discontent towards uh, his vision, and uh, do you think that this is actually a uh, negative example of the way art could function as a cultural diplomacy, and how do we actually deal with that? I think it's quite a good example. Thank you for, um, for mentioning it. I don't really know it personally, nor the artist, but I know that kind of art, provocative art. And um, you, you will never um, abolish this kind of uh, provocative art. You can even uh, name uh, Ai Weiwei as one of the most uh, famous provocative artists uh, nowadays and uh, holding the first rank of that field of art. In fact, he is a conceptual artist. And I was quite deceived when I saw the show. But I, I don't want to comment this now. But um, pro provocative art is a mean to uh, make people aware uh, of um, dangers or dispositions in a very visual and, and uh, radical way. And sometimes it helps. So uh, I think you should rather not educate the artist and tell him he should not uh, do this kind of things um, uh, because he would uh, insult the Turkish people. Uh, if you um, remember that um, Marcel Duchamp has uh, presented his Urinoir uh, as one of the main uh, pieces now highly uh, um, um, admired uh, um, uh, of ready-mades in the early 20s. And it happened that uh, one of the French visitors in a show on ready-mades in Marseille uh, started to urinate in the Urinoir. And the judges didn't know how to deal with this event because it was all new. It didn't really destroy the, the item, but um, the visitor had to, to be um, judged and, and they really had difficulties with that. So that means it stirs a whole debate on a social concern. And uh, I would rather say you have to educate uh, the one that uh, looks at it, the viewer. And the viewer is us, our perception. That is the main thing. Uh, another example, uh, in a Lithuanian artist that I included in the Mare Balticum show, because I also had contemporary artists of all these nine countries, uh, was the, um, Daimantas Nazivicius. And he um, had uh, poured uh, cement in two walking shoes, quite elegant men's walking shoes. And you can easily understand what that me meant that the um, citizens of Latvia, uh, or Lithuania rather, were not able to walk with these shoes where they wanted to go. And um, the, the meaning, the message of um, artworks is sometimes much stronger than any word, even if it's sh uh, shocking, and rather because it is shocking. So I'm rather on the side of the artist. Hello, um, and thank you for your lecture and the work that you do. 
My question, though, is that um, if, you know, we as interns are here, it's because we genuinely had an interest in cultural diplomacy or we wouldn't have applied. The people who come to your exhibition gen must have an interest also in understanding the message behind the art and understanding, you know, other cultures. Yeah. How do we get people, you mentioned Marine Le Pen, her followers and other extreme, you know, right-wing extremists. How do we get those people who have no, like, remotely any interest in cultural dialogue, how do we get them to hear those kind of messages that we are more receptive to? Very important question. I was asked a lot of, no, maybe 15 years ago, by the Memorial in Caen, in Normandy, the first French museum uh, that dealt with the debarquement, but also with uh, the, the wrong figures um, based on the uh, almost uh, all national French resistance. They corrected them correctly. And therefore, they, they were uh, highly um, debated and even hatred as an institution. And they asked me um, to do a very interesting uh, project on nat national prejudices. How uh, uh, was the perception of the French uh, people of Germans or uh, Austrians uh, looked at Germans or in uh, English uh, at French, etc. And I did that and it, it was almost finished and then they wanted to put it on the program and the um, regional council declined it because it was too political. And nowadays I think one could do it, but only on the level of caricatures because um, it, it would, um, and there are many publications like that also, but it's never been done as a, an all over exhibition. And that would be a big uh, topic to do on a European level, even as an itinerary exhibition. And I think I, I do it once, and, or maybe you do it. It's, it's really quite amusing to do it because it's awful. And, 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 and the, the bottom line is everyone hates the other and so on, no one hates anyone. That's the issue, if, if, it, if you really come to, to draw the line. And uh, this should be realized because then uh, uh, these arguments of hostility towards the other and the stranger um, of uh, parties and people and representatives like Marine Le Pen, they, they, they can't find the um, arguments anymore. It's very simple. I would like to thank you once more for your lecture. Um, my name is Sandra and I was wondering, according to you, which are the European countries uh, which have got more difficulties nowadays to deal with their own national histories? I would say the, the, the Germans, to, to start from the positive side, I'm really not a German nationalist. I'm rather half Danish German, and now I've become French or whatever you like. I'm European. Um, the Germans with their um, difficult past and, and uh, especially with their fascist past have done what they call in German the Trauerarbeit, the, the work of mourning. And that is slowly, slowly um, recognized by, by the others, non-Germans. So they are maybe on the top rank of having uh, really done the difficult work of dealing with their um, special national history. The Danes are um, uh, named and, and called to be the most happy, the mo happiest people in the world. But they have uh, the highest um, rate of suicides. And um, if you go to Denmark, you, you find them very relaxed and family orientated, etc. So I think this is quite wrong. They are not the happiest people in the world. And, um, but they have not the least difficulties with their national history, nor the Swedes. They, they even didn't, I was married to a Swede. So I can tell you <laughs> about that. And um, uh, the Finns as well, all the Nordic uh, people, they, they are very happy with their national histories. They don't really hate each other. But um, my husband, who was a very learned and, and uh, very knowledgeable person, Pontus Hultin, uh, the founder of the Centre Pompidou and many other 
world uh, known museums, he uh, did not like the Danes. And he did not like the Germans either. And I asked him, why do you deal with me? Well, you are a different person. And um, I would say the Poles have lots of problems with their national history because it's sort of rooted in their history. They, they still have difficulties to deal with their national identities because they always feel squeezed between uh, Russia and uh, Belarusia, etc., etc., and uh, Ukraine and so on. The Austrians that I know quite well also have difficulties with their national histories because they've never digested the loss of their empire. The French have um, actually enormous problems with their national identity, even to, to the point that they become rather non-European minded, uh, even those that do not vote for Le Pen, uh, because they, they, they have lost all um, uh, faith in political acting and their representatives. They become anarchist. It, it's really like that. And, um, the English, they deal with the um, uh, very difficult fact that they have to face uh, the eventual loss of Scotland. So that does not make them uh, any happier because uh, the Scots are the rich part of uh, England. And the Dutch, I would say, they are quite happy with their monarchy. And they are uh, well settled and, um, well, they, I, don't, they are, I can't really see any uh, major um, national uh, difficulties, especially that I have recently visited and I could uh, recommend it to you very um, uh, intensely, the newly set uh, Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. For me, it's the best museum I've ever seen. You should really go there. It's so well done. And uh, they did it within 10 years of work. And then when it comes to the Balkans, uh, they have a lot of difficulties, but this is um, uh, to be understood because of their history, uh, even beyond the First World War up to the, the Turkish Wars. If, if you don't know their history, you don't understand anything of the Balkans, and so on and so on. So uh, there are very, very many difficult um, uh, straits of uh, failure and um, uh, lacks of identity or even um, posing your ident identity on a historical map. And all this forms the, the diversity of Europe. And it's a big step that this diversity of Europe and the, the different uh, positions and uh, attitudes have been uh, equally acknowledged and recognized. So that is uh, the real truth of uh, European success to me. But if I look to the boat people and the Italians uh, that have the challenge to deal with it, it is heavily difficult. Hi, thank you very much. My name's Emily. Um, just going back to art and the controversies it can cause, uh, we're very fortunate in Europe today that there's lots of artistic and exchange. Uh, lots of museums are willing to share uh, their works of art so they can be enjoyed by many people. There are still some difficulties with uh, the idea of where art should be displayed. Um, an obvious example is the Elgin Marbles, which are held at the moment in London, um, which causes difficulties with the Greeks. But there's plenty of examples all over Europe. And I just wondered how you thought these difficulties could be overcome. There's a very actual example of this difficulty caused by the Ukrainian conflict. Um, I, I, I wanted to see it, I, I couldn't manage because of time in Amsterdam and the archaeological museum was held, uh, or maybe is still until some uh, July, um, uh, an exhibition on the skeet uh, with um, items uh, from the Archaeological Museum in Simferopol uh, on the Crimean. And when, when they, they signed the contract, the loan contract, everything was to, um, to be given back to Simferopol. 
But now the archaeological museum in Amsterdam has to face and find a solution to deal with the difficulty if it should be given back to Simferopol, that means uh, Russia, or Kiev, in means of territorial integrity. I, I don't know the outcome of this, uh, this um, problem, but that is a very good example for, for the problematic. And the Elgin marbles and, and uh, all these other um, claims that have partly been dealt with, one of the most famous is uh, the uh, Hottentotten Venus in Paris that has been given to Nami Namibia uh, from the um, former Musée de l'Homme. And it, it was a big diplomatic task for, for the highest ranking uh, French politicians up to the foreign minister. Um, this is something that has uh, really to be dealt with, but uh, I think uh, you can also take the position that uh, the uh, museum, like uh, the British Museum that is um, hosting <laughs> the Elgin Marbles, uh, is one of the universal museums uh, that uh, should um, keep those uh, parts. And um, I went to the Acropolis uh, two years ago, and uh, they have succeeded in doing all the, the freeze of the, uh, uh, the uh, Pergamon and, and uh, Parthenon um, uh, temples with the different parts that were left lacking by, um, um, by, by um, computer synthesized uh, parts that were replaced by copies or else by, by projections and then by the real parts that they hold. And um, I was the only one in a very learned group that could decipher uh, this enigma because I knew the, um, uh, the, the reference numbers of the British Museum. They did not uh, dare <coughs> tell that these parts were in the British Museum. And I would really post it. I would uh, really write it out. That has been taken by uh, Lord Elgin, etc. Tell the whole story and um, just communicate it. Because this is also European history. And um, uh, you should not deny it uh, on the places where it has been done, the, the act in, in itself. And. Um, this is something that the politicians do not understand and they don't like it either. But uh, if you would uh, do it the way I would do it, you would definitely get very big difficulties, not with the British, but with the Greeks and the Turkish. Because at the time when Lord Elgin took the marbles away, uh, he um, dealt with the Turkish authorities. The Turks were the sovereigns of Greek, Greece at that time. And, and um, this is a very important um, um, mission to make it understand uh, how um, difficult uh, the task is. Uh, because the Greek do not want to acknowledge that they were under Turkish occupation at the time. But that is part of their national history, etc., etc. So the best is just to tell the biography of these items, and then you get it all. But it's not done. It's not done in the British Museum either. They don't dare do it. And it should be done. And it would avoid a lot of cultural conflicts. <laughs>